Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. I love seeing all these students. I know that you weren't compelled in any way to come um, on a Friday afternoon. And um, to my colleagues here, um, thank you for coming. I am so, so excited about today's presentation. For those of you who don't know me, I am Stephanie Rolfe, and I am the Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives here at Millsaps. I'm also a professor in the History Department. Um, and so my work crosses a lot of different spaces. Um, I'm actually not the main feature today, so I'm only gonna talk for another second to recognize the kind of community support that an event like this requires. Um, we have several partners who helped bring our speaker, Colette Pichon Battle, to Millsap's campus today. And I wanna make sure that we properly thank them for that. So the Pathways Program, um, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a moment, um, what is one of our sponsors, as well as One Campus, One Community, and the Wellspring Community. Wellspringers, please stick your hands up and wave. <laughs> You're welcome, I know. I'm, I'm gonna have to apologize for that later, I guess. Um, the uh, TRHT Center at Millsaps, also the Truth Racial Healing um, and Transformation Center is one of our co-sponsors. And I am um, also pleased to recognize our Public Events Committee for enabling us to bring these kinds of speakers in, and, and they are also sponsoring this program. I'm most excited to welcome our representative, Chauncey Spears, our community engagement specialist from the Alluvial Collective. And the Alluvial Collective has done a lot of critical work throughout the state of Mississippi, especially um, in its, uh, previ under its previous title, the Winter Institute uh, for Racial Reconciliation. And they have been equally enthusiastic to help us bring Colette in, and you'll be hearing from Chauncey in just a minute. So with that being said, um, I'm finally going to recognize my, my real um, team players here, Ryan Colvin, um, Tabitha Fadina, Brittany Woodburn. This is my team. And, and um, Geneva Torrance, who will be kind of getting us rolling today. Thank y'all so much. I just couldn't do anything without you. <laughs> Geneva? Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, even those who were required to be here. We thank you, and I think you're going to get a lot out of today. As Stephanie said, my name is Geneva Torrance. I am the Director of Pathways and First Year Experience. Some of you are familiar with Pathways. Some of you may have been hearing about it through the grapevine. Pathways is one of our initiatives under the strategic plan. Uh, Pathways is a four-year program for all Millsap students. Um, really, when we think about Pathways, it's helping students connect academic interests, professional curiosities, and become a citizen of the world. And that's a little bit, I think, what Colette's gonna talk to us about. Pathways is all about vocational exploration. Vocation in the larger sense of our calling, our purpose. Our callings and purposes can change and shift over time, and we need to be prepared for that. And not just what are we gonna get paid for nine to five, but how can we again contribute to the world at large? And that is why I'm really excited to hear from Colette in a little bit. I wanna also introduce Chauncey Spears. Um, with the Alluvial Collective. Chauncey is a veteran educator and a community champion who is originally from the Memphis, Tennessee area. As Stephanie said, he serves as the community engagement manager and really focuses on the areas of educational equity and community development. Chauncey believes that education can be the key to human flourishing and his life's work has been committed to cultivating educational equity in the communities around Mississippi. So Chauncey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am excited uh, to be here, and I, and I want to thank uh, the sponsors uh, and the people here at Millsaps College for inviting uh, not just myself, but more importantly, Ms. Colette Pichon Battle to uh, Jackson and to this campus to, to talk about some very important issues around uh, what, what generally will be described as equity uh, and, and how we can together 
uh, work to ensure that. At the Alluvial Collective, which is, sounds like a funny name, uh, but it, it really has some significance. Of course, uh, formerly we were the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation at the, from the University of Mississippi, ironically. Uh, uh, but, but what happens you know, in life is that uh, we find that people tend to, uh, uh, out of these interesting circumstances, come some great champions. And one of those champions for Mississippi, I believe, was indeed former Governor William Winter. And uh, for 20 years, uh, the William Winter Institute did a lot of, has done a lot of great work in and around Mississippi, around the areas of, of racial reconciliation. And from that work, um, uh, we, we really believe that ultimately, uh, what it comes down to is relationship building. And, and so um, today I want to just begin to give you a little bit of what we do at the Alluvial so that you can get an idea of how relationship building can go far in terms of creating the kind of communities and kind of societies that you want to see. So um, after uh, former Governor Winter passed away, his family decided that they wanted to use the William Winter name in order to establish an educational trust at the two museums at the, at, at, here in Jackson, the uh, Mississippi Historical Museum and the Civil Rights Museum in Mississippi. And so from that, uh, we looked and we thought about how could we uh, capture what we do uh, in our name and then in, in, in how people know and understand who we are. So we thought about Mississippi itself and, and what makes Mississippi, Mississippi. And one of the great things about Mississippi is its soil. Uh, the great Mississippi River uh, deposits rich soil all along um, the, the western coast of Mississippi, but that, that soil is, is, is emblematic of who we are as a people and have people, how we become to who we are. And who we are has a lot to do with history and a lot to do with storytelling and has a lot to do with connecting with one another. And so we looked at the alluvial plains of Mississippi as a metaphor for the opportunity to actually build community one person, one relationship at a time. And that's what we do at the Alluvial Collective. Our work generally, you know, over the last 20 years has centered around what we call community building, which we go into spaces in local communities in and around Mississippi, and we create spaces where people can build trust through sharing their stories. We call it the welcome table sometimes, sometimes we call it the story circle sometimes, uh, where people come together in spaces where they can be safe, they can be courageous and they can be vulnerable because sharing stories is very personal, but what it hopefully it, what it does is it builds trust. And from that trust, we think we have strong bonds of relationship and thus build community. Now, our community building space, of course, yields a space for an opportunity for engaging young people, such as yourselves, many of you in this room. And so a lot of our work uh, is dealing with young people. One of our premier programs is the what we call the Summer Youth Institute, SYI, where we have bring students from all over the, the state to a different college campus uh, over the years. And we come and we do uh, story circles and we also do tours, you know, historical tours, because we want to ground our relationships in the history of the place and the space that we're in. Uh, and so what I work with community building and our work with young people, uh, we found that there's an opportunity also to engage systems leaders in the community engagement piece. And that's where I came in. I'm kind of the newbie on the team. You know, and so what I do is I try to go into communities and, and I cultivate relationships among people who may make decisions about where resources go, people like your alder people in your local communities, your uh, uh, boards of supervisors, maybe even some school board members, some PTA uh, leaders and things of that nature, hopefully get them in the same type of space where they can build trust, build community, and so begin to see some of the challenges in their communities through an equity lens. And, and with that equity lens, we hope to begin to create and cultivate spaces where flourishing can happen for everyone, not just people in certain zip codes. Uh, so, so that's in a nutshell is what we do here at the Louvre Collective, but enough about me, enough about what we do. And we're here to, to celebrate and to learn from this champion, Ms. Colette Pichon Battle. Uh, she's a generational native of Bayou Liberty, Miss, uh, Louisiana. Bayou Liberty, Louisiana. I was say, we, we were talking earlier about how we tease the upper south states rather than, than the deep south here, Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, she did find the Gulf Coast Center for, for Law and Policy and led the development of programming focused on equitable climate disaster recovery, global migration, and community and economic development and energy democracy for more than 70 years 
17 years here in the Gulf South. Colette now serves as a partner of the of Vision Initiatives at Taproot Earth, a global climate justice organization working for a world where all people can live, rest, and thrive in the places that they love. And I love that, that, that line there. Um, and and I, I came to know um, Colette through um, studying some things about environmental justice. And one of the things I came across was a podcast where she talked about her early experiences as a young lawyer in Washington, D.C., and how um, and she began to explore different issues around uh, supports for marginalized people when disasters strike. Of course, you know, one of the biggest dis uh, natural disasters that we had was Katrina in 2005, and she was, I believe, in D.C. at the time, and, and, and it came uh, to be around people who were making choices around how to support and reestablish the area that was most um, directly impacted. And one of the things that she talked about that she learned was that a lot of the laws around uh, supports, a lot of the laws around helping to help people in those areas and those communities weren't tailored toward the marginalized, weren't tailored toward the racial minorities or the poor and things of that nature, but they were tailored toward the middle class. And that really crystallized some things in my mind about how we begin to see disparities and how we begin to see, you know, uh, the, the, the lack of opportunity and access for so many people in different and diverse communities. It's not just a natural happening. It actually is structured. It actually is, in many instances, could be quite intentional, if not, if not just not people not being seen. And, and that, I think, is the tragedy of not having community, having a relationship, is that people get left out of the equation. And so that's, I think, the, the challenge before us is to make sure that nobody is left out of the equation as we begin to plan. So, so with no further ado, you know, you know, we come here to hear uh, Miss uh, Colette Pichon battle and welcome her to the stage, please. Thank you, Chauncey, and I am so excited to be here. I didn't know people had to be here, that's funny. Uh, so thank you, um, and thanks for those who don't have to be here. Um, my name is Colette Pichon Battle. I love, I love uh, when I get to speak in the South, people can actually say my name right, so that's good, good start. I also just wanna take one second to offer my gratitude to Stephanie and Geneva um, uh, and the team. Um, I have been treated with um, what I would expect no less uh, in Mississippi, but um, grace and Southern hospitality and some good food and some good conversation. So thank y'all, Millsaps. Um, and I also just want to say happy Black History Month. Burr, 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 burr. No, I, no, no, okay. I won't do any more party whistles on the microphone. I'm just going to say it's Black History Month, y'all. So um, happy to be speaking um, at Millsaps in Black History Month. Um, and I want to honor the river soil. Um, I mean, where else can we start a conversation by, uh, by honoring um, the soil of the mighty Mississippi and the land that comes from it? Um, I'm from right down the street in Slidell. I don't know if y'all know where Slidell, Louisiana is, but it's right by Mississippi. Um, I think it's all one area. In fact, um, honoring the Choctaw Nation uh, proves that it was all one area. Um, I live in Choctaw Nation territory in Louisiana. I know I'm in Choctaw Nation territory here. There is no major river boundary to, to separate us. Um, and so I'm actually your cousin from right down the road and it's great to be, great to be here amongst family. Um, thank you Chauncey and the Alluvial Collective. William Winter Institute was a big part of my uh, leadership development uh, post Katrina. Um, and I just want to say I'm really glad that that work has continued. Um, that work has spread across the Gulf, and it is worthwhile, and thank you for that. And I just want to offer my um, love to Susan, uh, who, was, who was really leading all of that. Um, and thanks to Millsaps. What? I got a cup. I'm ready. <laughs> I love the purple. I'm here. Um, and also, my little cousin went here, um, and our, one of our organizers is a 1999 graduate of your sociology and anthropology program, Michael McKenzie, and he was also in your football hall of fame. Just want y'all to know he's working for climate justice now, and he's working with us, so shout out to Millsaps and this great education that you're getting here from this institution and the way you're being encouraged to think about things and who you're being encouraged to be. I just want you to know sometimes y'all end up on the right side of things, fighting with us and fighting for the right things. And I want to say thank you for all of the things you're going to do uh, with this beautiful future that you're getting at this great institution. 
Um, I'm here to talk about climate change. Air out of the room. Uh, because usually when you talk about climate change, you have to talk about climate change. Um, this thing is real, y'all. Um, if you're not quite convinced that it's real, I'll convince you. We can meet outside. There's some hummus, and we can <laughs> sit and talk about it. I can convince you over hummus that this is real. We could take a lot of time to debate whether or not it's real, or you can just come to the conclusion that 99% of the scientists around the globe have come to, which is that this is not just a real warming of the planet, but it is something that we have never seen before. I'm hearing the talking points. Doesn't this happen naturally? Something happens naturally. This uh, pace of change is not natural. It is not natural what we're going through. And I don't have to convince you, because I know you have seen here in Jackson, rain events, cold snaps, hurricanes. I know you felt the heat. And I want you to know that while all of those things were part of the Jackson experience, they are now more extreme. And this is the change that we have to focus on. It's not that you won't get weather and weather changes. It's that now the climate crisis requires you to understand that what we are about to experience is a level of extreme weather that nobody's ready for. Your pipes aren't ready for it. Your house isn't ready for it. Your cars aren't ready for it. None of your public transportation or your healthcare system is ready for it. And you're not ready for it if you haven't been paying attention to what's going on. So my job is to make sure you know that there is a real situation that requires not just you to understand what you're going to do, but it requires you to understand who you're going to be, like Geneva said. So I'm really excited about this talk because I usually have to just talk about the downside. But the truth is, the only upside to the climate crisis is you. We've got another generation of folks paying attention, looking at the world differently, moving with a different kind of courage and a different kind of creativity, and we just might get out of this thing. But it's now time for all of you to lock in on this particular issue. This cannot be ignored anymore. And every issue that you think you're working on will be absolutely impacted by a new climate reality. And that's my job, to make sure that when I leave here, you know that. Everything else we'll discuss over good food and crawfish and when, when you're 21 over some beer. Not yet, not yet, sorry, sorry, sir. I know you've got, we've got administrators here. Um, after you're 21, we will discuss that. But the, the point right now is that you've, you've got to save us. I love you, good night, just kidding. Um, so, how many of you were born after 2005? I have to ask this question. Okay, how many? <laughs> All the old people just got nervous. We were like, please don't raise your hands. Okay, how many of you were old enough to remember Hurricane Katrina? Uh huh. Okay, what do you remember? F from your own memory, not from a news clip, not from a story, but just shout out something that you remember, or raise your hand, something that you remember from that moment. Evacuating, where'd you evacuate to? Yeah, Arkansas, so kind of far, several hours evacuating. Anybody else evacuated? Anybody else remember that? Y'all remember that? Hours it took some people to evacuate. Days in places like New Orleans, weeks. Um, yeah, what else? Well, one more thing you remember, your own personal memory from Katrina. Yeah, it was hot. Y'all remember that heat? What'd you say, brother? I just remember I was in college when it happened, so I was about five and a half hours away from my home. Uh-huh. How many people didn't have touch with their family for some time? Does anybody remember that? We were like looking for people. You remember the cell phones went down? We couldn't get in touch with people. We had to learn text. I know y'all do that all the time now, but like back in the day, we had to like learn that text messages could go through even if calls could not. Ooh, but that heat. There was some heat that came after that storm. Um, and the heat always comes after the storm. So does the sun. We'll talk about that and what we should be doing with that, with that energy. Well, Chauncey was right. When Katrina hit, I was in DC and I was a corporate attorney. Anybody going into law? Yes, yes, we need you. The lawyers will save the day, okay? The artists will lead the line, but the lawyers will save the day. I'm just telling you, we all have a role, we all have a role. All of you going into law, let me tell you, yes, please do, we need you, it is important. Um, when I was a corporate attorney, my job was to basically help companies. Um, to make sure that they were following the law on any number of things, and that's my job, and it was great. It was a, a great um, 
opportunity, a great learning. I wanted to be in D.C. D.C. is fun. They have a lot of cute people. I was single. You get what I'm saying. D.C. was the place to go. I mean, what I meant was I want to save the world. I want to be president. I'm going to D.C. No, of course not. You're going to choose somewhere where you want to have a good time. There's nothing wrong with that. We were just talking at lunch. Some people going to Houston. Some people are going um, to Colorado. Yes, you have to dream like that. And when you get there, you have to contribute. And when I lived in D.C., I used to volunteer. I used to bring food to um, people who were shut in with AIDS. I, that was my everyday Saturday morning. I would just do something good. You know, before I spent the rest of my Saturday wasting my time, I would just start my Saturday by bringing people some food. All I had to do was drop it at their door. They couldn't leave. They were sick. And my job was to be helpful. So every day, I was a lawyer, and then I did good things on Saturday. And it's such a great life. You get to feel good about yourself. Your bank account looks good. You could dress nice. Um, but there's a little, you know, it's a little one-dimensional. It's a little one-dimensional. And then Hurricane Katrina hit, and I got 22 million dimensions to choose from. It was no longer an option to be a one-dimensional person. Just a paycheck, feeling good about myself, looking cute, going to the club every now and again. That is a one-dimensional life. And Katrina came and required me to add more dimensions to my life. I can do all of those things. But my people need me, and I have to show up. Now, I'm lucky to come from the South, as many of you do, to come from a community that really invested in me, really cares about me, wanted me to do well in school. How many of y'all come from those communities where somebody was like, did you do your homework? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Because you were already smart. They saw it. They saw it when you were in junior high that you were doing your homework, that you were doing well in school, that you had a, uh, an ability to learn, and even sometimes a love of learning. And that is really important. Right now, it probably feels like it's just important to get a degree. And that's the game we're in, OK? We got to play that game. Get the degree. Pass the test. Get the degree. But there's something else, which is that you come from a place. There are good things about the South that never get said. But I'm going to tell you this, and don't ever forget it. We come from a part of the country where people invest in us, where our communities actually hope that we do well and that we bring not just our brain, but our heart and the things that your grandmama taught you into your workplace and into who you're going to be every day. So this is what happened with me and Katrina. Yes, I was an attorney. Yes, I had this, this level of skill and knowledge. But I also had a community that invested in me, and it was completely wiped out by a 30-foot tidal surge off the Gulf. And I don't need anybody here to forget there was a 30-foot tidal surge off the Gulf. Because this story could turn into broken levees in New Orleans, which is part of the story. And that story is really about the injustices that come with all of the disinvestment from black communities and poor communities across the US. But there's a bigger story here, which is a 30-foot tidal surge and a storm that was so strong that it hit three states at one time. And that's if you don't count when it hit Florida on the way here. And we have to understand that what happened in New Orleans and those injustices and those breakdowns will happen more as we get more extreme weather and as the climate crisis really takes hold. This is not a topic. This is not an issue. This is now officially your life and mine and the reality that we have to sit in every day. The good news is the question that you're searching, what do I do? is absolutely connected to who am I going to be? And what you do and who are you going to be, while you should take those as two separate questions, are absolutely connected. And I want to make sure that you know that I am never, ever lacking for an opinion of what people should do. I love this question. Colette, can you tell them what they should do? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I know you got to be here, so now you're stuck listening to what I think you ought to do. The first thing I want to tell you is that you got to be yourself. And me being myself was coming home after Katrina, starting the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, and really developing myself. I had to learn a lot, y'all. I had to unlearn probably more than I had to learn. You think climate science is hard? Try decolonizing yourself. That's hard. You think you got to learn greenhouse gases? Try unlearning all of these little messages you've been learning for 30, 20, 40 years. That's hard. And it doesn't happen overnight. So I don't want you to think that I got to all of these conclusions overnight. I did not. But I did do a little work. 
And that work was rooted in where we are right now as an organization. So I started the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, but just last year we were able to launch Taproot Earth. And while I'm gonna put some words up here before you, I'm just gonna say the vision of Taproot Earth is a world where we can all rest, live, and thrive in the place we love. And it's real simple, but it's not easy. Live, rest, and thrive in the place we love. That is our vision. And we're saying this in, inside of a new climate reality. At the end of the day, at the end of 17 years, what I've learned is if I can get you near me for 10 minutes, I can get you to understand this climate crisis at a level that you will absolutely want to join the climate justice movement. And I will do this, and so will everyone that I work with, by touching six key items. We call these climate justice pillars. We can either talk about water, we can talk about energy, we can talk about land, and if those don't tickle you right, we can talk about labor, we can talk about economy, or we can talk about democracy. I guarantee you we can go through any of those doors and get to the exact same place in the middle, which is all of us looking at each other through whatever door we walk through and say, what are we gonna do? And who are we gonna be? It's the question at the middle of all this crisis, and it's the question that I wanna make sure we work on today. All right, shout out to the Taproot Earth team because they needed me to put this up. I'm done with that part. I figured out how to work all the tech. Thanks, I got new friends helping me make this out. Now back to me telling you what to do. Colette would like to tell you what to do with your life. Just a few suggestions. The first thing you have to do is be yourself. The second thing you need to do is have the courage to acknowledge some truths, some tough truths. Now listen, courage is an underestimated element of this climate crisis battle, but you're gonna need it. You're gonna need it, and you're gonna need the ability to do hard things. So I don't mean to make jokes about you, next generation folks, except I have a few comments about you. You're not building a reputation of people who like to do hard things. So I just wanna tell you, friends, you might wanna build up that muscle a little bit. It doesn't mean that you don't call out the things you're calling out. We need you to. You have the most vision, courage, and creativity I've seen. We like it. What it does mean, though, is that when you call that stuff out, you got to tell us what you're willing to do to make it right. Bring your muscle, not just your critique. Bring it to the table. We need you. Bring your energy and your ideas, not just your criticism of what exists today. It's broke. You need any more? Let me verify whatever it is you're pointing at is broken. I agree, you don't have to convince me. Let's fix it now. What you gonna do? And that's my question. But let's go back to who you're gonna be. It's important for you to be yourself. It's important to acknowledge hard truths. And one of the things we have to acknowledge about the climate crisis, and here's a question before I make the acknowledgement. How old will you be in 2030? That's my question. Do the math, 2030. What is it, 2023 right now? How old will you be in 2030? Someone shout out a number. 30, somebody's gonna be 30 in 2030. Uh-huh, how old are you gonna be? 29, uh-huh, 23, 28, okay, okay. So we got 28, 29, 30. A few of us will be a little over that. Um, <laughs> we don't have to talk about those folks. We can just hand, we'll stay in this middle area. How old are y'all gonna be? Um, 28, 29, 30, think about that. That's right when you are supposed to be um, thinking about your family, thinking about starting your life. You will have all of your degrees because you will graduate from the great Millsaps College and then go on to somewhere else wonderful. You're gonna be 28, 29, and 30. And in 2030, when you are 28, 29, and 30, we will reach the point of no return in the climate crisis. The point of no return is when you are 28, 29, and 30. This means if we don't see drastic, I don't mean incremental, I don't mean little, I mean if we don't see drastic and revolutionary change in this country and around the world by 2030, we're in trouble. And this is not me trying to scare you, this is me telling you the facts. If we don't reach if we don't change drastically by 2030, we will be in trouble. We reach the point where human existence will have to start shifting. 
People will not be able to live in the same places they live right now. People will actually have to start moving. Water will dry up. Anybody paying attention to that mighty Mississippi and that alluvial soil? What happens when the river doesn't run? The lowest point ever on the Mississippi, and that is the springtime after three rivers were dry in Europe. And we're the people with the resources. So imagine what's happening in places where people don't have resources. It's important to understand that the climate crisis is real. It's not a topic, it's not an issue. This is a condition that you and your professional selves will have to deal with, and you're gonna have to be part of the solution. And to be part of the solution, you're gonna have to be at least, number one, a person who can understand, a person who can appreciate, and a person who can discern fear versus danger. You have to be able to understand, appreciate, and discern the difference between fear versus danger. Right now, a very necessary emotion inside of you that helps you sense danger is being manipulated against you. It's being manipulated in the social media. It's being manipulated on the television. It's being manipulated in some of the groups that you are a part of. And it's telling you not only that you need to fear people like me, not only that you need to fear what's going to happen to you and your community, but you need to fear running out of stuff. You need to fear not having your steak and your hamburger, as they say, when we start talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You need to fear having access to water. Right now, your fear is being manipulated against you, and if you don't have the ability to discern when there is real danger versus when somebody is messing with your mind to make you understand fear in a way that you should not be even giving energy to, you will be part of the problem and we need all of you to be part of the solution. You have to be a person who can understand, appreciate, and discern fear versus danger. You have to practice courage in order to be this kind of person. You actually have to practice courage, and you have to amplify truth. Right now, most of us are in a society that does not teach us to be courageous, especially if you don't have anything individually to gain, right? I could stick up for myself, Sticking up for them over there, I'm not sure, I don't feel good today. I got on the wrong shoes. You are gonna have to practice courage now. And it won't always be for yourself or your crew. It's gonna be for people who don't look like you, people who don't have what you have, people who don't maybe even understand what's happening. You're gonna have to have courage, you're gonna have to practice courage and you're gonna have to amplify truth you're gonna have to show up and do your part on both of these. Now this is it's simple words, I'm saying courage and truth. You know these words. You learned these words a long time ago. But how do they fit in your life right now? And how are you showing up? Are you showing up? Are you showing up right now? You're gonna to have to be a person who seeks, a person who honors, and a person who cultivates wisdom. A person who seeks, a person who honors, and a person who cultivates wisdom. In order to do this, you're gonna to have to know the difference between data, statistics, and Western science versus traditional knowledge. You hear what I'm saying to you? This is new for some of you. There's data and statistics and Western science, and we know and we could tell during COVID that there are consequences because this tool has been used against the very people who need to be part of a justice solution. We are now sitting inside of legislators, uh, legislatures, inside of organizations that say, show me the statistics before we can move. I don't believe the words of the communities, show me the proof in numbers before we can move. Let me see how many people died before we can prevent death. That is the system we live in right now. Show me the numbers before we can fix this. No, nah, friends, that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. Instead, what we need to do is understand the traditional wisdom of many indigenous cultures that says, if I got, you got. If I'm eating, you eating. I don't even really have to like you. I just have to honor and acknowledge your humanity. You deserve to be safe. You deserve to be okay. When did our society become a place 
where you had to have access to education and resources to be safe. To be safe? Well, just in case you think there is danger right now in the world, let me tell you, the climate crisis will bring all of these issues closer to you. It is now officially time for you to understand the difference between data, statistics, and Western science and traditional knowledge that says we must care for the place that we depend on. How can we pollute water if we need water? I mean, think about this. How can we pollute the water if water is life and we need water to live? We are now paying money to industries to pollute the water that we eventually need. And I'm in Jackson, so I know y'all know what I'm talking about with this water. I know y'all have actually dealt with the question of what happens when we have no water. And why do you have to have resources to access life? This is the society we live in now, friends. And what we need instead is for you to be able to seek, honor, and cultivate wisdom and discern between what is being handed to you as statistics, data, and proof, but you are being told to ignore millions of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years of evidence and information because it doesn't fit into a Western standard. This is incorrect. And we now need a different approach to a very real problem. In order to be this wonderful, real, true, full person, we're going to need you to be an ally for three things. And this one might shake you up a little bit, but let's talk about it. You're going to have to be an ally for tribal, tribal sovereignty. An ally for tribal sovereignty. That means you absolutely cannot not know whose land you're on. No more. Every single, play, every single time you go somewhere, you need to understand and acknowledge whose land was it before it was taken. Because let's be clear, the very hard work that many of us have done, that our parents have done, to get the house that helped to raise you, to get you that education, to live in that good school district, was actually somebody else's land. And they never got paid for it. And they are now struggling because somebody took their stuff and then told them to compete with everybody else. At the very least, you need to be acknowledging the fact that everything we are standing on is on top of some stolen, terrible history. But I cannot allow you to stay in that negative place. I have to urge you to learn how to acknowledge and move. You have to take the time to acknowledge we will not repair without that. But if you stay and spin in that space, we turn into this society of hate and fear. And we cannot afford that right now. We have until 2030. I didn't make this up. I didn't make up that, that number. I would have given us more time. If I was just making up numbers, I would have said five million years from now, we'll, we got we to gotta struggle. This is international science that could be agreed on by the world, which means it's probably not even that long. This is the conservative model. 2030 is what we have to do. You got to be an ally for tribal sovereignty. That means we got to get behind these tribes and their struggle that have been going on since day one of colonization. Now look, we can act like colonization didn't happen. We can pretend like this thing didn't happen. But we will not get to the climate solutions we need if we don't acknowledge the history that got us here. So you're going to have to just have the courage to admit what happened and how we got here. We cannot spin we have to go, but you got to be an ally of tribal sovereignty. You also have to be an ally of black liberation. What, Colette? Colette, I'm not black. I, cannot, I can't possibly, I cannot possibly advance black liberation as a non-black person. If you don't, you won't make it either. Because when black people get free, everybody gets free. And you know that one to be true. You can search deep within yourself, young Padawan. You know that to be true. You know that the least valued people in a society, if they are absolutely allowed to participate in a free way, means everybody comes up. You think me participating means you won't participate? That is not how this country works. Come on. If I get something, you lose something? Come on now. That's not how this country works. We have enough resources for everybody. 
We have enough where everybody can be okay. Everybody can live, rest, and thrive in the place they love. Why do we have the deficiencies? And why is it so pronounced in Mississippi? Why? Now we got to acknowledge history again. This is not just a coincidence, everybody. This is a legacy of slavery in this country. I don't need you to sit there. I don't need you to spin there. But you don't get to pass over that. We don't just get to say black folks really should work harder. That's not what this is. This is not individual choices we're dealing with. These are systems that have created the reality that we're in now, and we're going to have to change it. Strike that. You're going to have to change it. Our, our young sister in the, going to the legislature, I know you, I'm not, I'm not going to put your name out for governor yet, but someday soon, maybe you'll run for governor. We need folks who are allies to tribal sovereignty, folks who are allies in advancing black liberation, and folks who understand and are advancing economic justice. Economic justice is really interesting because in the climate crisis, there's a very easy question that comes. Hey, why don't you just leave? Why don't you evacuate to Arkansas? Why don't you get out the way? What do you need to get out the way? You need some money in your bank account. You need a car that can make it to Arkansas. You got to eat on the way. Arkansas, that, was, that took two days to get to Arkansas. You got to eat on the way, maybe stop at a hotel. This is resources. This is money. This is income. If you are dealing, living in a place that is going to get more extreme weather and you've got one of the highest poverty rates in the nation, what do you think is going to happen to your people? You think they're going to survive this? You think they're going to get out of the way? They will not. They cannot. We have a racial wealth divide in this country that shows everybody doing better except black folks. And in Mississippi, it's even worse. Something's not right here. Working two jobs and not being able to feed your family is not right. The current job situation that we're having in this country is not about people being lazy. It's about, at some point, the federal government acknowledging what a minimum standard of income should be and how most of us in the South don't make it, especially those without a degree. And now we get back to the history of this place and the reality of this place, and we put all of that with a climate reality that is coming straight toward us and has already been here. We are the canary in the coal mine to the world. We are uh, out in front of this story of climate change. The Gulf South, which includes the great state of Mississippi, is showing what will happen to you and your people when you run out of water, when the storm hits, and when your government leaves you to fend for yourself. We need you on the solutions. We need you to be an ally for tribal sovereignty, black liberation, and climate justice. And this does not mean you get to usurp people's stuff. It does not mean you get to just do more taking. You don't get to just take indigenous knowledge. You got to ask for permission. You don't get to just go stand uh, for, and, and shout out for black liberation. You got to do that in partnership. You have to be an ally. You don't get to just move because you are compelled to move. You have to figure out how to be in community. And sometimes you have to figure out how to follow people who do not look like you and people who you have been given little micro messages all your life to not trust that they can make the right decision for themselves or for you. You're absolutely going to have to have the courage to challenge these things inside yourself. And finally, you're going to have to be a person who in any situation can absolutely see the possibilities for making our society and our world the best society in the world it could be. Now, I want to tell you, this one's not easy, but it is where your futures go. If you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a veterinarian, if you're going to be, I forgot what, what the other kind of doctor was. They were, listen, the artists and the, and the, the, the arts and the sciences were blowing my mind at lunch. Um, if you're going to be an artist, you have to do what God gave you the ability to do. You've been given something special. Some of you can get up on a microphone and talk real loud and talk real easy. That's what he gave me. And you know what I got to do with it? I got to use it now for my people and for our advancement. What is your gift and how are you going to use it? That is a question. But the bigger question is, how are you going to, are you going to use that to make our society better? How are you going to see the possibilities for you to insert yourself, not just what you do, but the good person that you really want to be? How are you going to do that? You're going to have to think about things 
like climate impacts. One of them, climate migration. Anybody heard this term before? Climate migration? What do I mean by this term, climate migration? Anybody? Uh-huh, no idea. What is migration? Moving around, yes. Moving around, y'all got friends help, the administrators are helping y'all, the students are, students are waning, students are waning. Moving around, that's all migration means. We get confused with migration and immigration. Let me stay away from immigration because I'm just meeting y'all today. We can talk about that one tomorrow though. But let me talk about migration, which is, it doesn't matter what country we're talking about. I'm talking about the movement of people. The movement of people. What happened during Katrina with Jackson and, and people moving? Do y'all, if you remember at all, you'll know that large populations of people from the coast came up here. This was a staging ground. You couldn't even get to Slidell. You had to stop in Jackson. That was as far as the federal uh, military was letting people go. They weren't letting you go down there. People had to come up here for safety. Guess what, y'all? Those migration patterns are going to continue. They're going to grow. They're going to increase. They're coming to your community. And what is the condition of your community right now to outsiders? Let's just, let's just talk about it. Are y'all ready to welcome people? Are you ready to welcome people who don't look like you, sound like you, talk like you, and eat some strange thing called gumbo that you don't know, that you believe is not as good as barbecue? That's who is going to be next to you in your neighborhood. Are we ready? And the question is not, are you ready to secure your house? Are you ready to hold on to the things? Are you ready to be scared of your neighbors? That is not the question. The question is, are you ready to make this opportunity a moment where our whole society gets better? What if we're ready? What if our communities are ready to receive people, no matter what language, no matter what race, no matter what physical ability? What if we were absolutely ready to, to put people into a workforce that actually helps build up a city? I don't know, replacing some pipes or something. Just a guess, just a guess. What if we got ready for the migration that is already happening, if you got ready for the migration that is to come, and if we decided, if we had the courage to say, what's happening right now in our society is actually not the best that I think we can be. I'm going to take this opportunity to get with people who are like me and make this society more welcoming, stronger, better, everybody can prosper. And we're not going to do it in the reaction to people coming. We're going to plan for it. Because climate change is real, y'all. Migration is already happening. Now, we talk about it as though it's happening over there to those people. But I am telling you, many of you have families who have not returned to the coast because migration is sometimes permanent. Because storms are not something that everybody can get through. I mean, what happens if you don't have the ability to run out of your house or stay on a roof for two days? You can't be in those places. You're going to have to get yourself to safety. This is a real thing for you to begin to think about. How will your medical degree help those migrating communities? How will you as a journalist help to tell the story of the people moving in a way that brings the society together? How will the science that you help to develop help people live better, longer, and healthier lives? This is you doing what you're going to do, but this is you being very clear that there is a reality you have to connect with. And at the end of your connection has to be some level of equity and justice. This can't just be about you making a good paycheck. They told you that, they're lying. I'm sorry to be the one to deliver it to you. We no longer live in a world where you get to think about your paycheck. Because let me tell you what happens in climate disasters. The banks go down. The ATMs go down. You can have money in the bank if you want to, or you can be part of a community that can withstand the storm. You can be a good person. It doesn't stop you from being a wealthy person. It just means you're choosing to be a good person. You're choosing to be a person inside of a community. You're choosing not to just be an individual, but to be part of something bigger. Which leads me to one last piece, which is you have to believe in something bigger than yourself. I don't pretend to know your religion, and that is not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about your spirit, and I am talking about your soul. And at this point, if your soul and your spirit does not believe that a higher power wants you to treat everybody around you better, then we will not win. 
Because what we're up against right now is a social movement that is telling you, you are an individual, your choices are just about you, and whatever you choose is freedom. And that is a lie. You are not an individual, at least not all the time. Sometimes you're part of a human race. Sometimes you're part of one global people. And every now and again, when the problem is that big, we have to move together. We have to take care of each other. We do not have to like each other, but we do have to honor and acknowledge each other's humanity. We will not survive without each other. You do not make it alone. We have to combat individualism in your mind and understand you have to be part of a collective. And if you have any trouble getting to that, belief in a higher power, something greater than yourself, will get you right where you need to be. For those of us from the Deep South, your grandmama already told you this. Your auntie already told you this. Paul Paul and them said this to you. I'm not saying anything different, and I'm not saying anything new. What I'm saying is, grandmama and Paul Paul and them were right. You have to love the people around you, even when they make you mad. You have to see yourself as part of a community, even when you disagree. What we have as Southerners, as people who live in the Gulf South, as folks who come from traditions and places and people who believe in a higher power, who believe we have something to contribute, and who believe we actually do have the power to free ourselves, we have wealth. If we have that, we have wealth. And if we have that, we have the solutions here in the Gulf South. I'm excited to be a part of your future. I'm excited to hear what you're gonna do. I'm excited to know that you're gonna fight for the right thing. And remember, no matter what you do, who you are is the bigger, more important question. And I need you to be courageous. I need you to get in this thing. And I need you to bring your best gifts and your best efforts. And if we do that, if you do it and I do it, we can change. We can change this outcome from one of doom to one of liberation. And that's what I want you to leave here with. Are you going to be part? Is what you do and who you're going to be going to be part of helping all of us get to liberation? This is a climate justice conversation. Just in case you think climate is about greenhouse gas emission reduction and carbon capture and all the rest of these ridiculous things that are being put in front of us, it is not, friends. This one is about our moral obligation to each other as humans and our contribution and our offering of gifts into the solution. And I'm looking forward to see what the graduates of Millsaps bring to the solutions table. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hi, my name is Leslie Sweeney. I am a first year biology major and I am also a member of Wellsprings and One Campus One Community. And we are now going to open the floor for any questions that you guys might have for Ms. Collette. I love that question. Is this thing on? Yes. Thank you, friend. What's your first name? Uh, Kristen. Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you for that question. Um, what I'm saying is the atmospheric changes that we are experiencing and calling climate change, they used to be called, it used to be called global warming. We're calling it climate change. The atmospheric reductions have a root cause. So um, the, the, the emissions that are going up in the air are not just because factories put emissions in the air. The emissions that are going up in the air are because we have looked at things like land and natural resources and chosen to privatize and dominate them. So 
we might make a technology that says, hey, let's take carbon out of the air and put it in the ground in some pipes that will likely burst in a community that is likely black and is definitely poor. And let's reduce greenhouse gases by trying a technology that hasn't been proven to work near the people we care about least. And I'm saying, instead of doing that, why don't we just invest in justly sourced renewable energy so we don't have to have the chemicals and refining happening near that black community. We can still reduce the greenhouse gases by just moving people over to renewable energy, but instead of doing a technology that would maybe create or advance the same problem, let's look at the solution in a way that addresses past harms and future realities at the same time. We absolutely have to reduce greenhouse gases as part of the game. But where are the greenhouse gases coming from? They're coming from factories and refineries and petrochemical uh, facilities that are producing products mostly for the US market and the Western Europe market, Western European market. We are consuming ourselves into a climate crisis. The problem is not let's touch the green, let's reduce the greenhouse gases. The problem is we got to change society from consuming the way we consume. It's a bigger solution, it's a bigger answer than that little top of the question that we normally get to. The climate movement is problematic in some ways, especially groups that don't have to care about things like justice. They can just think about a tree as something they enjoy on vacation when they drive to their vacation property. But that mindset says you get to own and privately hold land and trees and water. And that notion is what we have to shift. Now, this is a big shift. This is a big shift. Reducing greenhouse gases with a technological solution seems easier. We should just make a machine to stop it. But the machine didn't create it. The philosophy created it. The philosophy that says some people are worth more than other people. Some people are worth less than other people. That philosophy got us to climate change. It wasn't just greenhouse gases. It's extraction. It's exploitation. It's what we see every day in the labor force. If we don't change that, we will end up in another problem. Maybe one bigger, probably the same one. So we do need to reduce greenhouse gases, but we do not get to just talk about this as an issue that has a technological solution that then changes us from one oppressive system to the other. We don't just get to switch from gas and nuclear-powered energy to, renew to sun and wind energy. We don't just get to make that move. We actually have to get the community con to control their own energy. We actually have to move laws in the great state of Mississippi to allow people to have their own independently energized homes because they have access to the sun after the storm. Now, this means the utility companies won't make their millions. This means a lot of people won't make their millions off of the poorest people who are paying the biggest amount of their paycheck on energy. They live in your state. So if we just move from one type of energy to another without breaking that system, we don't change the system. We don't actually change the harm. So I, it's both and. Thank you for that question. That is the question. Um, the, 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 the opportunity here is to approach the solution looking for equity, which means acknowledging the past harm, acknowledging a future reality, and finding a solution that gets us to address both. That's the opportunity. Thank you, Kristen. Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> Is this like fast, fast fashion? Yeah.
You're, you're, you're 100 percent right. And the textile industry is actually number three for greenhouse gas emissions. It's absolutely connected to the global warming conversation. This isn't just about waste. Because this is where we go with plastics. This is where I've, I've, I'm, I'm saddened to hear where we go with plastics, which is just clean up the plastics off the beach. Yes, clean up the plastics off the beach. Yes, save the turtles, save the turtles. Yes. <laughs> also, why is there so much plastic on the beach? And where does this come from? It's a product of fossil gas. It's a petrochemical product that was actually waste that they figured out how to make money from. And then they lobbied your legislature and mine and said, can you force this new product into the market so we can make money? This is how you're being used. You, your fear is being manipulated, everyone. You don't actually need a new bottle of water every day. Come on. You don't. We don't. Maybe you need a filtration system. But could we just reuse the cup? You know what I'm saying? Could we switch to a paper? And by the way, there is no one thing that any of us can do individually that will get to this problem. This one is about telling oil and gas to stop producing single-use plastics. Anybody ready for that fight? You want to know how that one's going to go down? We're going to take billions of dollars away from billionaires? Y'all want to know what that fight's going to look like? It's going to look like discrediting people like me and attacking people like you because the minute you start taking power from the people with power, they fight. The good news is when you organize people to recognize the power that we all have and you put it together, we fight too. We fight too, but we can fight for the right things. And sometimes we dance when we fight. We don't even have to fight all the time. Shout out to the queer community who's teaching us, you know what, we could just do this with joy. We could do a lot of really hard change with joy. Because that's part of our fight, too. That's part of our fight, too. We can't just keep doing this stuff with domination. I like to win, y'all. Listen, I'm a Saints fan. Y'all want to know how sad I am this year? I'm sad about it. You know what I mean? I'm sad. I like to win, too. But there's a bigger win here. And it's not your individual trophy. It's our collective survival. Your clothes, your plastic, everything you buy, them shoes, that hat, everything you want, the way you use energy and all the lights you didn't turn off and the air condition that's running and the heater you're not paying attention to. If you put all of that together for the US, one American uses as much energy as 370 people in Ethiopia. One American. I've had two conversations in the last two days of men sitting next to me on the plane and here's how the conversation goes. Well, isn't it um, population control? Don't we need to just control the population? No, no. Because that's a word that people say when they want to control brown and black bodies. If we want to talk about population control, we have to control the consumption, not the population. Who's consuming the stuff? Oh, it's not brown female bodies in Brazil and Nigeria. It's white male bodies in the U.S. and Western Europe. Oh, oh, we, do we want to change? Are we ready to change that? I'm ready if y'all ready. You might need a little time to build up some courage, but let's just, I'm ready whenever you're ready. But the consumption is the problem, and our country is consuming. And our country is consuming because they say you want it. And they make sure that Walmart is full every day. It doesn't just have enough for you. It has enough so you don't feel like there's not enough. They literally fill the shelves in the store so you can feel abundance. Not because you need 22 Frosted Flakes, just because you need to see 22 Frosted Flakes as you take one. This is, they're manipulating you. And you're believing it. This is why you have to have the courage to discern against this. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe nothing I said. You can go look all of this stuff up. You can come to your own conclusion. But you don't get to conclude that this is not happening. You don't get to conclude that this is about individual choice. And you don't get to conclude that you can sit by and watch it happen. Bishop Desmond Tutu says, if you are neutral in moments of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. You don't get to be quiet on this one and you don't get to not pick a side. In fact, I'm inviting you over to the side of folks who are trying to figure all of this out. And it's not just in the US, it's across the globe. 
and they're waiting on the people in the United States who have so much privilege and who don't have to worry about things to join a global movement that says we could in this moment choose to save our planet and the people on it. We could in this moment choose to do something better than what we have right now. All we need is courage and a little humility that says, maybe it's not me who can lead this. Maybe it's somebody else, but I can follow. Word up. Hey, oh, can we call, oh, I'm, I'm, let, me follow my, um, let me follow my leader, Leslie, here. It's true. I, I have two separate answers. I, I went to two different places from that. But let me just say, the, the plants and animals are migrating, says my friend the biologist. And I've, I've made many, many science friends today at Millsaps. Loving it, loving it. The rest of us are going to law school. We, don't, we didn't do well in those classes. Um, <laughs> the first thing about the plants and animals moving, let me say this, because that is actually proof that borders are false. Somebody fell out of their chair just now. But, but what science, what, 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 what the natural world is proving to us right now is that borders are false. Things move across lines all the time. So we should be learning from nature because nature will always find a way to survive. This is not about will nature survive the climate crisis. This is about will humans survive. This is about will humans survive the climate crisis. Nature will find a way to survive. And it is teaching us that some things that we have in our very limited human minds are false, like borders. And it's important to understand that in the climate crisis, we're going to see more of that, not just insects and animals and plant movement, but we're going to see more viruses move. These are, uh, uh, after Katrina, we got a slew of mosquitoes that were carrying West Nile and Zika. That stuff came with the storm. These things move with the storm, with the wind. Not to mention the invasive species coming up just through the land. So what do we do about them? I think we're going to have to figure out how to live with the changing natural world. I will look to the scientists to figure that out. But I do want to bring in a different side of that question, which is traditional knowledge and understanding an indigenous way of living. So I don't need any of you to just go claim an indigenous identity. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that many of us come from communities, indigenous to Turtle Island, this place, or indigenous to Africa, indigenous to Asia, indigenous to other places. Those folks say there is no distinction between you and the animals and the plants. You actually need them and they need you. There's a whole system and ecology that happens because you work together. I think we have to start thinking about this. We are being taught to think about trees and water and plants separate from your existence. You're being taught to think that food comes from the grocery store. No, no, you purchase food at the grocery store. Food comes from the land. Do you know how to grow your own food, by the way? Because you're going to need that as these storms come more and more. You're going to need to pay attention to these plants and animals and invasive species that take out your plants. You're going to need to start paying attention to the ecology and the natural world, not because you get to just have a garden that you're proud of, but because you're going to need food. 29 and 30 and 28 years old and 2030, this is not a game. We are going to see disruption in the community because there will be a deficiency in food and water. And if we don't understand plants and animals and insects as part of our ecology, as we're part of a whole ecology, if we think about them as separate, we will fail. And I want to critique the environmental movement because that's where this comes from, which is rooted in a supremacy philosophy around people and land. And it says, the environment is for you to fence, conserve, and enjoy for your recreation. 
They put fences around parks and they call them national parks. They put fences around places and they say, this is the designated place for you to sit and have green space and be peaceful. Because what we are living in is a society, as a society that doesn't see that you should have a peaceful place in where you live. You are part of the thing. The park is not separate from you. The green, the trees are not separate from you. You are part of an ecology. And you've been taught to believe that you can survive on your own in an apartment and get your food from the grocery store. That is just not true. You have to see yourself as part of a broader ecosystem. And the solutions that you come up with in this climate crisis have to be part of a broader ecosystem. We have to see the impact on that ecosystem as well as the impact on the people. That's where my real answer goes, which is we have to re-indigenize ourselves. We have to rebuild our relationship to the land. I hope you all take a moment, sure, hug a tree, but also you could just go fishing and sit by the water. Or just feel that breeze and understand that you do not live alone. You live as part of a broader ecosystem and you have to take care of it or you will not survive and neither will I. So I like the question. We gotta put, it, put ourselves back, back in unison with that question so that we don't see it as different. We see that saving us means saving the plants, saving the animals, and dealing with, dealing with all of that at the same time. Word up. Thank you for that question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John <laughs> Colette, can we take one more question oh, sure. from our distinguished alum over here? Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. That was respect, y'all, in case y'all didn't hear that. Brother just gave y'all respect. Okay. Word up. Thank you. What's your first name, babe? Boyd. Boyd? Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Um, love the question. The question was, when we saw climate migration and we saw communities having to um, take on a lot more people, the systems failed. The health system failed. The other systems failed that was mentioned. What are we going to do to prepare, and is this a legislative cure? Uh, what I would say to that is, yes, it's a legislative action that can be taken, but we're going to need lots of them. So good luck, Mississippi, in getting some legislation through. Um, what I see even more accessible than that is municipal level change. Like, what happens if some of these students ran for city council or mayor? And what happens if these places that they come from actually create commissions right now, before the storm, to prepare, to assess the community and what they need to be able to welcome people in. What happens if we get a whole bunch of people from the coast in? What happens if we get a whole bunch of folks who don't speak English in? What happens if we get a whole bunch of folks who have poor health outcomes into our place? What do we do? Assess that ability. And at the municipal level, start building what you need in order to have a successful society. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, that's gonna cost a lot of money. Well, here's what's interesting there actually is a lot of money. There, build, there are billions of dollars about to come to your community. Billions. And none of y'all, none of y'all come from communities that are prepared to receive it. Billions. What happens? What happens if we start paying attention to the billions of dollars that are going to be taken by oil and gas, they're gonna be taken by all of these big corporations because they got a full team of people whose job it is to go find the legislation, read where the money is, and understand how to get it. Why aren't we learning that? And how do we use that money to say, we're gonna build schools in our community, we're gonna build housing in our community, we're gonna build a transportation system in our community, all prioritizing the influx of people who will need to be able to use it and get around. 
And we will start holding dialogues in our community like the welcome table that says, you know what, we got some stuff to deal with. We got some history on us. We have some legacy on us that we have to deal with. So it is a legislative solution to a certain extent, but mostly this is about, you know, who can we organize within municipalities to get cities and towns ready to be welcoming communities. I think that's probably one of the biggest opportunities we have. So we are working right now, I'm so honored to say I'm working with the um, State of Louisiana Governor's Climate Initiative Task Force. And one of the things we've been able to contribute to the conversation, not quite guidelines yet, but we're calling them equity metrics. So when you make a plan, and everybody's going to have to make a plan, every city's going to have to make a plan. When you make a plan, how can we ensure that you doing a particular action leads us not just to a solution, but to equity? So our organization, Taproot Earth, has been working on those equity metrics. And we hope that once we're done, it will be used in places like Mississippi and Texas and Alabama, places that have very similar cultures and societies to ours, and equity metrics that are rooted in data and statistics, because you know we got to have that and have this whole conversation, but actually get us to a better society. So I'd be happy to share that with you. I'll make sure that Stephanie gets that. And, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Boyne. Um, Colette, I can't adequately close this out except to say you have effectively troubled our waters. <laughs> and that's exactly where we need to be. So we don't have all the answers for you. I'm troubled myself. And I want you to sit with that and sit with the complexity of that and the enormity of that and, and try to be okay with being in that space while you're getting active. Follow Taproot Earth, follow Colette on social media, start learning more, ask more questions. I know that's where I'm headed now. Um, a final thanks to TRHT, the Public Events Committee, Pathways, One Campus, One Community, and especially the Alluvial Collective for enabling this event to happen. Um, I hope that your weekend is restful. I hope that we can move this conversation forward in our classrooms and in our community across our campus. Um, thanks so much for coming, everybody. 